let's start and let's hope for the best. So, uh, what we are trying to do today yeah. is to build uh, upon the concept of asynchronous programming that we touched last week. Uh, and we played a bit with timeouts uh, just with the feeling that some callback uh, no, could be delayed or stuff like that. And uh, uh, we try to today to do some uh, more realistic example uh, by learning how to use it as an interface uh, with the database. And in particular, we are going to use uh, uh, SQLite as a database uh, management system. Okay? Um, we, okay, today we're trying to use that uh, just for learning better how to program in a synchronous way. We have three ways of doing that in JavaScript with the callbacks and promises and await. So there are three, le three levels okay, of, of, of syntax that we can learn. But of course, it will be also. Uh, crucial when we are moving to um, real website, web applications, uh, that every web application should have a place where to store some data, it's information, no? it's uh, backend information. And uh, uh, in the backend, of course, we should have a database. Um, say we are aiming at, you know, at the minimal possible uh, technology on the server side, uh, the idea that we selected uh, across the many possible databases, the simplest one, which is SQLite. Uh, SQLite is not a real database management system. Uh, it's, that, it does, it's not a server you know, that you can run and you can connect and run your queries. Uh, SQLite is a file-based database. So actually, there's a file in your folders that contains information, and SQLite is just a library for accessing these files uh, and managing them according to a, say, simplified or limited version of SQL, uh, of SQL queries. Hmm? Uh, so it doesn't scale up. It's not uh, good for concurrent access or for very, uh, so, um, or for partitioning the database from its client. Uh, everything should be in the same uh, machine. But for starting, it doesn't require, require us to install anything else uh, or, or make the architecture more complex. OK? So, um, let's start with SQLite. So SQLite is uh, it was born as a as a C library, as a library for managing files in in the C language, and uh, uh, of course uh, uh, people built some uh, um, Java uh, sorry, JavaScript interface, uh, JavaScript API library for managing that, and uh, the library is called uh, SQLite three. Okay. So in our project, uh, if we want to do anything with, uh, uh, with SQLite files, uh, uh, the package that we need to install is called SQLite 3. You will see that if you search uh, that there are many libraries uh, uh, that give you access uh, uh, to SQLite databases uh, in, in many ways. So the API is quite different. Uh, there are several developers that we are working on that. This is the simplest, this is the, the official one, the first that was born. OK, so let's start from the basics. Then we'll see maybe some extensions later on. So how, how does uh, database access happen here? So after you install the, the library in your project, uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, to uh, create a database object. So a JavaScript object that contains the link uh, or like it's like opening a file. You are opening a SQLite file, okay, um, with a constructor called the database inside the SQLite library. So usually you require access to the SQLite library. You get the SQLite object, and this object has a set of properties. One of these is the database constructor function. The constructor function takes uh, two arguments. The first argument, as we can guess, is the name of the database file that we want to um, work with. And uh, there is a second argument that is a callback function that will be called after the database has been opened or after the library has tried to open the database. Okay, so. Uh, opening a database is a file operation, an input-output operation. <laughs> Therefore, in JavaScript, in JavaScript, it's asynchronous. 
so uh, this callback will be called after the, the database has been opened. And there is a convention across uh, a lot of asynchronous libraries that the callback function may have a narrow parameter. So what is the idea? Is that when we call a SQLite da database, the DB variable is just uh, a reference to something that will happen in the future. I don't know yet whether the database will be opened or not, whether we have the permission to open that file or not. While the operation is ongoing, uh, the, the SQLite library will try to open the file and will check whether there are some errors or not. After checking and really opening the database, uh, the library will call this uh, callback function that we provided as a second argument. And uh, this callback function will be called with one parameter that can be null or an error object. So it means that uh, if uh, the callback is called with the parameter null, means that everything will OK. Everything went fine, and so the database has been opened. We don't, know, we don't need to do anything. On the other hand, if there is some parameter which is other than null, something else, that will contain information about the error. So the SQLite library works in this way. Whenever we ask some, some operation, it will try to do the, the operation, and finally will call a callback that I provide. And the first parameter to that callback is always the error information. It can be null if no error occurred or something else. We know in this case there's only one argument. In other cases, there are more than one. So we should start building the idea that the results of an operation are not in the result of the function call. Rather, they are in the argument of the callback. So processing the result of an operation is something we do in the body of the callback function itself that we provide to the operation. OK, uh, we'll see better when we actually uh, interact with the database. OK, and at the end, of course, the database connection can be closed with a closed method on the DB object. Um, and how can we do some operations from queries to the database. Of course, we run SQL statements. And there are a bunch of methods uh, on the DB object, on the database object, uh, that allow us to run different, in uh, different ways uh, uh, our queries. Mm -hmm. The simplest one mm -hmm. is uh, all. So it is a, a database, uh, is, um, is a method for running uh, select queries. So the type of query where you have, where you expect to have a set of results. Okay, and uh, the first parameter of the function is the, the query itself. The last parameter is a callback function. Uh, so actually, you are providing the query to run and a function to process the results of that query. And processing the results of the query will happen in the body of this function. And uh, uh, in this case, the callback has two parameters. The first one is the usual error value. Now, if everything is OK, this not null if there was some problem syntax problems or I don't know, whatever, any kind of problem during the, ex the execution of the query. And rows, the second parameter to the callback is the actual result of the query. That is an array of the results. So the select uh, returns uh, 20, uh, 20 results. Uh, you will have an array of 20 items, and each item will contain one single result. Okay, so we we can try it uh, with some uh, example that uh, if you go to the week three uh, in our week's uh, repository, you find that you have a folder for an exercise four. We'll see the text of the exercise later on, but uh, 
uh, I already, inside this exercise for folder, we, you have a file called questions.sqlite. Okay. So it's a database created in SQLite that we already populated in the, in the previous days. So we can use that as an example. So you should download uh, this file. And inside this folder, or any folder you like, uh, I'm opening a terminal. And uh, let's see that the package.json in this case contains uh, SQLite 3. I already run the command uh, npm install SQLite 3. OK? So, uh, but not in this computer, so I need to install the packages. So in this case, SQLite and AJS were the two libraries that they added to this uh, example. Let's make a simple example, then we try to do the exercise on the Q&A website, but just for okay, seeing what is happening. So let's create a new file that they can call um, demo database. Okay. Can you read easily on the YouTube? A bit strange of talking in the dark. Um, okay. 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 So let's try to run a simple query on this database. Uh, use strict. Away. Okay. And. Uh, uh, we first open the connection to the database, so const database is, uh, sorry, first we have to require yeah, const SQLite, require SQLite 3. And so I loaded the library. And I can open a database by SQLite new, sorry, new SQLite dot database, where I have these two parameters. The first one is the file name. The second one is the callback. So the file name in this case would simply be uh, questions dot SQLite. Questions SQLite. And uh, okay, there are some optional parameters as a second argument if we want, but we don't need them right now. The, the last parameter is the callback function. So it's a callback function that takes an error as an argument, and that does something. And uh, what can we do, for example, is just to generate an exception if there is an error, for example. So if there is an error, then show an exception with this other object. In this case, it will create an exception by wrapping the string contained in the error message. So we can see that in the console. If error means if error is not falsy, and so in the, in the case where the argument is null, it's not uh, uh, the, no, it's not nothing with them. Okay, so uh, we try to open the database. Hmm? And uh, later on, we can start uh, doing some uh, query on it. Uh, First of all, I would like to have a look with you at the database contents. And so I install an, an, an extension. Uh, an extension in um, Visual Studio Code, which is called. Uh, let, it, let me find it. The actual name. There are several extensions for dealing with uh, uh, SQLite. And one is called 
SQLite itself, so it's an extension of your, in VS Code uh, called the VS Code SQLite. And uh, it, it's very simple, but it allows us to browse the content of the database. Simple. Browsing the content database, it's, uh, the interface is not uh, terribly easy to use if you select uh, the file with SQLite uh, with a right click uh, in, after you install the, the extension there is a open database uh, menu item that will open in, in the bottom a SQLite Explorer item where you can browse uh, you can see the table that are in database and uh, browse the data, the, their content. So let's uh, make it a bit larger. So in this case, I have a database called question.sqlite that contains two tables, question and answer. If you click on the table, you see the list of the fields that are defined for that table. And if you click on the small arrow besides the name of the table, you find uh, you know, a preview of the data included in the table itself. So for example, we have a, the table question with two questions and the table answer with uh, three answers, four, sorry, four answers linked to that. So we'll see the, the content. We, we don't care for the moment about the content. For us, uh, there are just some tables that we can, we can query. So let's try maybe to make a query on the answer table that contains more information. Hmm? I, uh, I opened the SQLite Explorer just to have the names of the tables and the name of the columns uh, so that you can use them in your choice. Yes? And now we try to do that if everything doesn't break down anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll wait through. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I can can I close the stream? Okay. Okay. So let's go back to our code. We open the database. Let's remember to close it if you want. After we need it to use it. And then we No, but let's Um, we run a query. So we say db.all gives all the results of a given query. The query is the first parameter. So maybe let's define it uh, as a separate variable. Select all from answer. Okay, so db.all will call the first parameter, which is the, the query, string. There is an optional second parameter for the query parameters, for the arguments of the query. For now, we don't have any because the query is just a, a constant string. So we can skip it, and then we have the callback. The callback contains two arguments, error and row. And with the body, where we can process the result. OK, so the result, uh, again, uh, is not in the result of the function call. This function call doesn't return anything useful. The result is uh, in the body of the callback. So for example, first of all, we need to check if there were some errors. 
then we can interrupt the execution, maybe. For now, just throw an exception, then we need to deal with that. Otherwise, let's put some braces. Let's just print what we get. Close. We have a string callback function. The actual result of the query is in the rows variable, which is the second parameter of the callback. Okay. So let's see if it works. Not uh, demo database.js. Okay, this is what we get. The result is uh, a list, an array, so we see the square brackets in the console. It contains two items, and these two items are objects. You see the braces. Okay, so the rows is an array of objects. Every object describes one row of the result set. In this case, I, I, I selected all the fields, select star, and so in the response, I have everything all the fields. So I can access from inside my program, I can access uh, the different fields that I need. So for example, maybe I want just to uh, list uh, the authors. Imagine we don't need all of this uh, information. One possibility, we can process the result, one possibility could be just to store the author somewhere. So maybe you can get uh, uh, authors is uh, what, rows.map uh, item to item author. So maybe you can create a list of authors. Uh, what's wrong here? Okay. So I, I got all the results and I'm processing them. And in this case, uh, uh, I get uh, just uh, the auto, and a list of strings uh, with the auto. So I use the map here to extract some information that I needed and convert it to a simple uh, list of strings, for example. So inside this callback, I, I am the owner of the row, rows information, and I can do whatever I want. Okay, of course, it's, if I only wanted the author names, uh, it would be stupid uh, to do a select uh, of everything. It would be better just maybe to select the authors. authors. And of course, uh, if we run this, uh, we get uh, the same result. First of all, the rows, uh, sorry. Let's clear the console because otherwise it becomes confused with it, all the new. But if we run this new, the last one, we have this the, uh, select author, not select uh, everything. I have again a list of objects. Even if the object only contains one field, it's always a list of objects. In the, if I want just to, to extract a list of strings, uh, my map operation does that and so on. Okay, right now we are only doing console.log here. And if we wanted to store this information somewhere, how could we do that? Well, of course. We could uh, store this result, for example, this result of the map, instead of a local variable, 
we can store it uh, into some external data that we must define outside this code. So we are using a closure to say, uh, to tell to the function, please uh, uh, store this information into an external variable. So we define a variable outside, let uh, authors, author list, author list. Initially could be an empty. And inside here, we update the value of author list. So I'm not declaring a local variable anymore. There's no cost, no let. I'm using the same variable outside. That will store this information. OK, so the same as before, the only difference is that I'm storing this information in an external variable. Right now we are in the body of the program, but it could be inside a function. So in any case, it's a closure over the environment, and in particular over this variable of its environment. It should work in the same way as before. And right now, it's printing the same information. Okay. But of course, printing is not useful. I want to use this information later on, because maybe I want to sort the names or do like something else. Okay? Count how many questions, how many times the same users, whatever you want. So even here, we could, for example, print the, uh, what's the name, author list. We can use it outside the call, not just in the callback, because we stored it outside. Or can we? Because if I run this code, okay. so let's say console.log. Outside, outside the callback. So, what is this print? It was before. So, what what happens here? This I. The last statement in my code here, I wanted to print the author list that just been computed. And these are the last instructions of my program. But as you see, it's the first out, the first uh, print that comes out. And the author list is still empty. Okay, this is the joy of asynchronous programming. In the if we look at the code, the order of execution is the following one. We define the author list as an empty list. We execute this function, db.all, that will schedule an operation on the database and return immediately. So when this instruction returns, The query has not even started. And so immediately after this, this, that is just writing somewhere, I need to do this query. Immediately, I print in these two statements. And no surprise that what I get is an empty list. Yeah, it was below. These two, these two statements, the two strings there. It's not a surprise. Then, in the meantime, the query will run, and the query will uh, call. When the query completes, it will call the callback, and the callback do does some computation. And we store information in the other list. But 
later on. Uh, probably, if I delayed these two operations by some time, I should be able to see the actual result. How much time? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Huh? Uh, but let's try. Uh, last time we uh, learned the timeout. Of course, it's not a good way of programming, but just to see what happens. We can set a timeout of uh, one second, and after one second, we can uh, repeat these two instructions. I'll set a callback, but later. So, let's first run it and then reason about what we are doing with the variables. I didn't save it, sorry. Uh, what's wrong with me? The timeout. Uh, ah, okay, switch the, the, the timeout with the callback, sorry. This is the other way around. outside the callback, but later I find the results. Because in the meantime, the query has been completed, of course, it will be much faster than one second to finish. And actually the value has been stored into this closed variable, the, the variable where, where we had the closure. Of course, we cannot uh, rely on this for programming. Okay, relying on of setting a delay so that the result is ready. Actually, we need to find a mechanism to process the result only here or after the callback has been called. Okay, so we must find mechanism in way, uh, if we just need this result and to do something with the result, uh, when we are fine, we do everything we need inside this callback. But if we need the result of this callback for doing something else, we need some mechanism for, let's say, sequentialize the execution or to condition the execution of later statements to say, OK, this should be executed only after the previous asynchronous operation completed. So we will learn the mechanism in the language for doing this. Uh, you, we will not try to make an asynchronous code synchronous. That's impossible. But we must find a way to specify some dependencies so that some code only runs when something else has been completed. Okay? And we will be done, of course, with callbacks, no? with some mechanism of callbacks. Uh, by the way, I want to notice a detail here. In line 28, I'm again creating a callback to that is closure on the same author list variable. Just be careful that when I create this closure, Auto release is still empty. So I'm not uh, making a copy of the current value of the auto release. I am saving the reference to the object that will change asynchronously. Okay, so be careful here to save an alias, save a reference, and not make a copy, because otherwise you will make a, a copy of the empty object, because you create this when, when this code is executed, and the code from 26 to 29, which is the set timeout function, is executed before the query is executed. So we should also be, be careful about that. So we have one variable that in sort, sort of uh, is a parking point where some one asynchronous uh, operation can store some value, and some other asynchronous operation can read the value. In this case, these two asynchronous operations are disconnected, and we are lucky if we read the value when it's ready. What we want to do, or need to do, is to learn how to connect them. Okay? So, but the basic mechanism is the same. Uh, in, uh, where are my slides? So, this was for the bit of all. Uh, you may wonder what are these parameters. Uh, okay, whenever we have uh, some. Uh, query that contains less imaging, we want, I only want to 
extract where is the database here the answers to question number one so there are some four, four answers here some are from question one and the others are from question two so let's imagine I only want uh, the answers to question one. That's quite easy. I just add in my SQL where a where clause uh, question ID equal to one. And I will get probably only three results. Yeah. One, two, three. We don't have the author of the answer to question number two. Okay, you can imagine that if this one is not a constant, but this comes from outside, from the user, it will be stored in a variable. Question number equal to one. So this is not a one, but it should be, in a way, the interpolation of a variable. There are three ways of doing that. Two of them are wrong. The wrong ones would be just to say concatenate a string, which is not wrong in the sense that it will get the wrong result. At the end, the string will be correct. The second one, which is you know, more fancy, nice looking instead of concatenating string, especially if we have more than one parameter, could be to use a template string. Okay, a template string where you can insert here the parameter question number. You are, working, you are building a string where you inject inside the string the value, the current value of a variable. Okay? This is wrong for security reasons. Because we are creating a SQL statement that contains inside the SQL statement uh, some substring that is coming from uncontrolled data, potentially uncontrolled data. So this is one, but if I, in some way, can manage to write something like uh, uh, string like uh, one comma drop. Uh, uh, drop the answer. What is happening is that this this query will select author from question ID equal to one, okay, and then drop the table. Hmm? So never trust data coming from outside inside a SQL query because you will be executing some external code with the privilege that your application has uh, onto your database. The solution is available because we just need to put a placeholder in the query. Say, OK, at this point, we have one parameter. This parameter comes from outside. And the value of the parameter will be provided as the second argument of the query. So the second argument of the db.all or, or other queries uh, is an array that contains the list of the values to be assigned to the different placeholder parameters. And in this case, it will be the question number. So what uh, the library is doing is take the query. If it finds uh, some placeholders, it will find their value, the value to substitute inside the, uh, the array on the second point. Okay. The difference uh, compared to the string concatenation that we had before is that this is done in a, in a safe way. So even if by chance this string, this question number, this parameter is a string that contains some SQL syntax, okay, the, the engine will not be fooled. It knows which is the query and which is the parameter. And the parameter will be escaped and it will be treated as a string. And this string will not, even if it contains some characters that are part of the SQL syntax, they will not be parsed by the SQL parser. 
they will just be the, so it, we are in this case selecting the answers where the uh, question ID is a drop table and we will find none. But so there will be no confusion. Okay, so never use string concatenation or interpolation for creating query strings. Always separate the query template that contains placeholders from the actual values of the parameters that are given as separate variables uh, inside the second parameter. Okay? So we always do parametric queries in a way when we need. Uh, the rest works uh, in the same way. All uh, is good for doing some select operations where we have a reasonable number of results because the query will get and collect all the results and put all of them into this uh, array. And then it's up to us to process that. There are other um, methods in the SQLite library. One is uh, um, get, and the get method should be used when we only have uh, one result. We only expect one result. Maybe if you are searching something uh, by providing the primary key or a unique field, then we know that the result will be none or one. Okay. Uh, if uh, I'm searching, when I'm selecting with a condition uh, on a unique key, on a primary key or a new value, uh, there can never be more than one result. So we could use all, no problem. We will get an array with only one object inside or zero objects inside. Or we can get get, and uh, in this case we only we have a callback where the row is called row and not rows because it's only one element that. Uh, uh, correspond to the first row of the results. If we have more than one result, one row, we, on, we only get the first. So the other one will be dropped, will be lost. Hmm? But we use, we use get when we expect only to have one row. For example, select count uh, or something. So uh, every aggregate function usually returns one number or one row of numbers, and we only need to, to read that number, the row. Or each, which uh, uh, works for results with many rows, but it calls uh, or it issues a separate call uh, call of the callback function for every row. So, in the case of uh, 1,000 rows, for example, the bit tall is calls this callback once with an with an array of 1,000 elements. Each with the same query will call this callback. So where did I go? Call this callback 1,000 times. Each time with the uh, the value of a single row. So it depends on what you need to do with your results, of course. If you want to wait uh, until all the uh, until you have all the results and then do something because you need all of them together, or if you just need to do something with each of them. You can also have, a, of course, this is some somewhat slower because we have the overhead of calling many times uh, uh, this callback function. Mm. But there are different ways of doing that. And these three, each, uh, each get and all, are good for select queries, where actually the, the query will return some result. For other types of queries, so all the data declaration languages, create table, all the data modification language uh, queries like insert, update, uh, de delete. I don't like delete. That's too dangerous. I never use it. But insert and update are SQL queries that don't return any any, any value. So mm, they have a slightly different format. They, we are using the b.run instead of all or each or, or get. And the b.run has the same format, but of course we don't have a result, we only have an error, an error information. So the callback only has one parameter, which is the error value. And uh, um, yeah. 
if the arrow is set only if the sum, maybe if you are doing an insert and you are inserting a duplicate primary key, then you will get an error because the data is already duplicated and so on. Okay. Um, here are some, there are some details I will have, we will appreciate later about, uh, especially when we are inserting some new data and we have some auto-incrementing uh, primary key. How to get the value that was assigned uh, is uh, in this uh, variable last ID inside the um, body of the callback. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we need now, right now, but just remember that when we will need this information, let's go back to this slide. Um, one detail, we will learn the reason later on where we talk about the, 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 this keyword, which is a strange behavior in JavaScript. Uh, for this uh, to work, for being able to get the last ID of the inserted element or the number of rows that have been changed by an update, for example, because maybe it's an information, so okay, I issue an update, did it update, really update something or not? Because maybe I did something, there are some wrong filter or what? For these two variables to be available, you need to define the callback function with the function syntax and not with the arrow syntax. So before we always use the arrow because it's shorter in the other callbacks. Here we are explicitly using function instead of the arrow because I make it short. Um, inside the narrow function that this keyword is not defined or it refers to something outside it. We will have uh, one more set of slides for the strange behavior of the this keyword. Okay. Okay, so here we're talking about parameter queries, uh, uh, which of course, uh, the, the simplest way is, uh, is uh, setting um, a question mark. Then if you go to the website of the SQLite library, it will, they will tell you that there are all other ways of setting named parameters. So like a dollar ID or dollar uh, um, author, so they will extract the actual field from an object instead of just providing them in you know, there are many ways, but there are just syntax uh, differences. Um, okay. Okay, so this uh, is an example of what uh, didn't work before. So, uh, just to better appreciate you know, the asynchronous nature of these queries, I, I did an exercise and I try to do something very simple. I create a table that contains a counter, a number, and uh, uh, this table will, contains, uh, will contain many ones. It's a stupid table where there's a number column with one, 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 one at each position. And inside the loop, okay, I insert new ones. And at, at each iteration, I um, count how many numbers we have. So ideally, we have only one number. Yeah. I so because I created the t this table with one way, one number like this. Then I insert another one. I select and count them. So I will get two in this count. Then I, I add a number one, another one, sorry. And I count them, I will get three. I insert another one, I get, will get four, and so on. Okay, so ideally, if I print the value of these counts, I should be, see an increasing series of sequence of integral numbers. If I try to implement this, in SQLite, this is the code I would write. I iterate 100 times the insert, the b.run insert, and the b.all select count, and then I get the first row, the total column from the first row. Um, just one, one detail. When I select the count, I rename the column as thought in order to be sure about what is the name of the attribute of the object. Since we are selecting the object dot thought here, uh, and uh, otherwise the name of the column would be count uh, asterisk, and we need to extract uh, 
you know, an attribute with a strange name. It can be done, but uh, it's better to rename it to something easy to, to understand. Okay. What the, the end result is this one, after running this program some time. So, and what I see is that the, the sequence is not really increasing. 89, 90, 91, 2, 90, from 92 it jumps to 96. These are actual real numbers, okay? I'm not make, making them up. 6, 6, 6. So for three iterations at a time, I always get 96, and then 97, 8, 99, 99 twice, and then 400 twice, and so on. We can imagine why. Because we have two queries that we are scheduling in a tight loop. By the way, the loop of 100 iterations will be finished very quickly. Because I'm doing the bit of run, the bit of all, increase i, the bit of run, the bit of all, increase i, and so on, in a very tight loop. And this loop doesn't do any real database operation. Um, we said before, and we'll see it better when we know the browsers, how the browsers work, uh, that uh, uh, JavaScript is single threaded. So as long as one thread uh, has the, is in execution, it will not be stopped, it will not be suspended. So here we are in a sequential code for increase i and so on. And so all this code will be executed up to the end of the cycle before letting the CPU use or work on a synchronous function. Okay? So this DB run, DB all, we are basically scheduling 200 queries. We are scheduling them in order, so there will be a queue of scheduled queries, but then when we start them, well, some of them may be a bit slower or be, maybe a bit faster. So even if I schedule them in the right order, that execution could be mixed up. It's normal. I cannot control that. I can't fight that. Okay. So this means that the code I wrote doesn't match this flow chart. Because this flowchart is sequential. It is telling me, execute this query after the, the previous one has been completed. And this is not what this code is doing. Okay? This code is deciding which query to run and then let them run. And we have no control. Of course, if I run this three times, I will get different sequences. Okay. How can we? Control a bit, a bit better uh, uh, the result of one query to the other. By the way, this problem is very complex because uh, we should put uh, the orange query inside the callback of the red query, but also the red query inside the callback of the orange query. So this is a, is a very particularly bad example because uh, one query should be executed after the previous one and the second after the first one. It's from the, we cannot just solve that uh, um, syntactically. We should find more complex mechanisms for, for doing that, for chaining this operation. And uh, the uh, structure, there are some constructs in the language that will allow us to manage this information, this operation. So basically, executing an asynchronous function is not difficult. The difficult part is uh, getting the results, okay? Uh, so the JavaScript language uh, is a mechanism for being able to, in some way, catch the result of, a, of an asynchronous operation and process that in a standard way. Before promises, uh, these are the kind of objects that we are using to, to do this operation, we only had uh, callbacks to many steps. So we had a callback that we, we call another function, and then we have the call of the callback. So the code was very, we had a very deep uh, nesting of callbacks inside callbacks, because every time uh, you had to, uh, and every library had a slightly different conventions of the callbacks, okay? So it became difficult to read. And after a while, they standardized a mechanism, which is still based on callbacks, but in a standard way. Uh, so for example, this is uh, an example of uh, uh, some 
uh, interactive task where I'm asking Framfi to our user, I wait for the answer to be available, and then I ask a second question, and I wait for this second answer to be available, and so on. It, it looks like a sequence of ifs, but it actually is a sequence of asynchronous calls. Uh, each of them is scheduled when the previous one returns. Uh, so it's very uh, inconvenient, mm -hmm. at least. So they invented this uh, promise object, which is a language feature that mm, is, is built inside the language. Uh, and or nowadays, it's the only way <laughs> that, that we want to work in a, in a synchronous uh, um, way. Uh, it's an, uh, what is a promise? A promise is an object that remembers that some asynchronous operation is ongoing. So you, just, you schedule something. When you schedule something, you cannot store the result of that, of course. You don't have it yet. But you can store a reference to the operation which is running. And this reference can be stored, can be passed away, and so on. It is an incomplete function, in a way. It's a function that will complete later on. But I have the reference to that. Hmm? And this reference is an object that has its own callbacks that will be called when the, uh, the actual operation completes. So we are not, uh, uh, say, building the callback inside the function call, but we are defining the callback on the promise object, which is separated, which is outside, which is easier to manage. We are extracting from the callback, um, in a way, the kind of uh, the Uh, we are putting the callback outside of the function call that creates the asynchronous message. But let's see that some example. Because, um, it's called promise because it's an object that sooner or later will give me the result. Okay? So when I call a function, uh, this uh, asynchronous function, if the function contains some asynchronous behavior, the function will return a promise. It will not return uh, the result later on. It will, turn, it will return a promise right now. I call a function, I, I immediately get a promise. Then I can decide the code to execute when this promise will be fulfilled. We have this language. Hmm. Uh, SQLite is an older library, so it still works with the callbacks. We will learn how to create promises out of, out of callbacks. It's very easy. Okay. But many other libraries uh, natively use promises. So it's the basic method okay. that we always use. So what is a promise? A promise is a simple object that you can create with new promise. And the constructor takes one parameter. And this parameter is a callback. It's a callback function that receives two arguments that are functions. And these functions can be called inside the body of my callback. So I create a promise and I define a body to execute. This body can do asynchronous operations if it wants. <laughs> and it can call the resolve function when the value is available. So it's, it's strange, because we are, the resolve and reject are functions that we can call, but these, uh, they are not functions we write. Okay, they are provided to us. There are ways, the resolve function is a way for this asynchronous code, this block of asynchronous code, to say, I have the result. I don't know what to do with the result. Console.log, no, it's not useful. I want to provide you with the result. You, who is you? I don't know. Anybody who wants to, a reference to this promise can process the result. So I'm separating the operation of uh, computing the result that will be asynchronous from the operation of processing the result. 
there will be still asynchronous, but outside this call. It will be decided by whoever has the promise object. Okay. So this promise uh, me, okay, uh, I uh, you, you do the operation and you promise me to call me whenever the result is ready. So actually, we have, we split the operations in two different callbacks. First is the callback for executing the code, which is the body of promise. A second will be the callback for processing the result. They will be called by resolve, and we'll see in a second. Why do we have two parameters of resolving the objector? Because in some cases, the operation may fail. And so instead of having the error parameter, which is somewhat ambiguous because we have one parameter that can be null or not, when we, they designed the uh, promises, they decided to separate uh, the um, good resolution of a promise from the bad resolution of a promise. So the promise may uh, fulfill or may fail. And from the point of the view of the code, uh, there, just, there are just two functions. If I have the result, I call resolve with the result. If something's wrong, I call reject uh, with some error object or error string or error message, some information about the error. Okay. Okay, and how do I uh, process a promise? We'll see some examples after the break. But so the promise does something asynchronous, does a query, and when it has the result, it calls uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, resolve with the result. Resolve rows, for example, in our. The promise object has two methods that are then and catch. Let's focus on then. Then is a method that I can call on the promise object that whose parameter is a callback that will be called when the, pro, uh, when the promise is uh, fulfilled. So this uh, was a promise that, was, that I created. Dot then schedules a callback to be executed when the actual promise body calls the resolve function. So you can imagine that the resolve function, in a way, sort of calls this one. It's not a direct call, of course. No? It's managed by the, 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 the runtime engine. But the, the effect is that when the promise body, the body of the ex execution function of the promise, calls resolve with some value, well, this callback link that I defined using the then uh, method is called with the same value of the result. If something fails, uh, uh, well, a cache method is uh, called instead. So resolve calls the callback of then, reject calls the callback of catch. Uh, if we take our code here, what it means? It means that we can, we could define, execute this code inside a promise. Okay. Say, so, okay, I want to define a function, for example, that. Uh, gets me the authors of a given question number. And there's a parameter as the question number. OK? Let's imagine you want a function that takes the question number and gives me the list of authors which is what we did before. This function needs to do some asynchronous operation. And so it will return a new 
promise object. And that will be basically the only operation that this function does. It builds something for executing the query. The promise has a callback. Uh, I never remember this name. Resolve. We can call it any way, okay, but the convention is resolve, reject. And then we have our code that we want to execute. We don't execute the code right now because we want to control what happens after it's executed. So we control, we let the promise object execute this code. Okay? And what is this code? Well, what we already had. We define the query. Let's move it inside here. And uh, let's run the query itself. Okay. Cut it and paste it here. Uh, with the question number is a closure of the parameter of the function. Okay, good. Because it takes this value and injects that in the, in, the, in the parameter location. And of course, at the end, we don't need to do all of this, but uh, of course, we don't modify the author list as a global variable because we saw that it's not reliable. We define a local variable holding this value. Constant. And instead of doing the console lot, we just do the result of the list. We are inside the callback of a callback. Right. The first callback is the definition of the promise that contains some asynchronous call. Okay, let's run it. And when the callback, when the asynchronous call, in this case, uh, will the, the, the b.all, will call its own completion callback, to jump out of the callback with the uh, actual result of the operation, we call resolve. Resolve will finish the execution of this uh, callback and provide the result where? Well, to the code that initially called this function. Okay? We are creating a new promise object. This promise object uh, below, we created some uh, res uh, my results or my authors is, uh, would be a my authors would be the name of the function, authors of question number one. So when I call this function, my authors is not a list of authors. My authors is the promise object that sooner or later will give me the list of authors. And how, so how can I wait for my authors to give me the result? But I can't really wait. I can only tell it what to do when the wait is over. The, the then method. My authors is a promise. Then, then means when the promise embedded into my, the variable my authors is fulfilled, then we have then the result, which is a list, and uh, let's print that. I don't know. So instead, instead of putting this print inside the query callback, which I don't know, the query doesn't know actually what I want to do with the result. I'm extracting the result from the synchronous code and setting up a separate uh, function to process it. So this should work in the same way. 
let's throw away all that. Okay, it will print these three names. It looks like we have printed, so it looks more sequential in a way. It is not sequential, of course, because at line 28, we are not executing the query. We are just creating the prompts. And in line 30, we are not printing the result. We are just scheduling some operation that will be started after the probe is fulfilled. And in this after word uh, is all the essence. We have defined a mechanism where we can specify in a clean way that some operation must be done after the completion of another one. So we can create the sequences of actions, which will not be in sequential code, but in a sequence of asynchronous code. OK? I will let this sink in for the next 15 minutes, uh, and then we fill in details about the catch and something like that. So let's make a break, and I'll try to set everything up again for the record.